Good morning. Welcome, dear audience. My name is Dr. Jorge Luis Pasarelli. I am a consultant geriatrician working in Hamad Medical Corporation. In name of Qatar National Dementia Task Force and Qatar Biomedical Research Institute, I am pleased to welcome you to the first web event on dementia research and risk reduction together looking toward the future held in Doha, Qatar. I also want to take this opportunity to welcome and thank all the speakers of this event. Dr. Hanadi al Hamad, Qatar National Lead for Healthy Aging, Medical Director of Qatar Rehabilitation Institute in Hamad Medical Corporation. Dr. Omar El Aknaf, Executive Director, Qatar Biomedical Research Institute, Hamad bin Khalifa University. Professor John Hardy, Chair of the Molecular Biology of Neurological Disease, Neurodegenerative Diseases, UCL, Queen Square Institute of Neurology. UK Dementia Research Institute at UCL and Institute of Neurology UCL. Professor Michael Freno, Chief Scientific Academy and Faculty Affairs and MRC, Academic Health Systems at Hamad Medical Corporation. Professor Henry Rodati, Scientia Professor of Aging and Mental Health, University of New South Wales, Center Director, Dementia Center for Research Collaboration, Co-Director, Center for Healthy Brain Aging. And Dr. Biju Bashkaran, Consultant Geriatrician and Risk Reduction Lead at Hamad Medical Corporation. Welcome everybody. Before we start the sessions, I would like to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the event. Please be aware that question and answer sessions will be held after each keynote speaker and that you are welcome to submit any questions in the chat box available for this. Due to large number of attendees and time restraints, we might not be able to answer all the questions. This educational event is hosted by Dr. Hanadi al Hamad and Dr. Omar el Aknaf. I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Hanadi al Hamad. Dr. Hanadi is the medical director of Rumila and the Qatar Rehabilitation Institute, as well as Qatar National Lead for Healthy Aging and Lead for Qatar National Dementia Plan. She is the chairperson of Geriatrics and Long-Term Care Department at Hamad Medical Corporation and has established new and innovative services such as memory and Falls Clinic at Hamad Medical Corporation, among others. If we can describe her in the words of Ms. Paula Barbarino, CEO of Alzheimer's Disease International, she describes Dr. Hanadi Al Hamad as the nature's force of dementia care in Qatar. It is an honor for me to open this great event with a welcome message with a national lead perspective on Qatar's dementia journey from Dr. Hanadi. Please, Dr. Hanadi, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. George, for your representation and welcome me in this warming world. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Omar, as usual, uh, his leading initiative uh, since he joined uh, HBK, uh, HBKU and um, really helped improvement uh, uh, dementia research perspective and uh, welcome uh, our guests uh, two guest speaker 
So our journey in, uh, for Qatar regarding Demetria started re really actually in 2012 uh, when I came with idea to start memory clinic here in Qatar. Uh, unfortunately, that time due to capacity and I'm sure most of institute facing the same problem. Um, uh, I'm requested to change my general geriatric clinic to convert due to space to memory clinic and believe me team, um, I stay six months, there was no single patient coming to this multidisciplinary team, which include myself and the representative from our colleague mental health, uh, old age psychiatry, occupational therapist, and of course, our nurse. Um, this is the place for memory clinic. Uh, this is Romaila Hospital, consider the first hospital here in Qatar. So maybe a little uh, stigma here in Qatar, you know, having a memory clinic, in the first old uh, hospital. Um, so I'm struggling till 2015 when um, Qatar invited to be part of 21 country uh, uh, to be part of uh, GDO or Global Dementia Observatory under WHO. As, as you know, it is web-based platform which will track progress in the provision of service for people with dementia and for their carer. So Qatar respond to that care and the, uh, the, the outcome for that uh, uh, participation, uh, the GDO help country to uh, uh, monitor the presence of national policy and the plan, uh, improve their risk reduction measure and help them to develop and direction for infrastructure uh, providing care. So there was four objectives for Global Dementia Observatory under WHO the first, whether the country providing better care for people with dementia and uh, how much they can reduce the burden and cost of dementia, uh, which is well known its cost for any country. Second objective, it was uh, to uh, this uh, GDO, it is evidence-based decision-making, supporting service planning, policy-making, and the strength their capacity as infrastructure. The third point, monitor the progress for the country and compare it globally. The fourth point, of course, it is a platform for exchange knowledge. And as we are here together to learn from you all. So uh, I will give you a little snapshot uh, of the of, uh, Qatar journey, not detailed one, but before behind the seal, my team. It's not my job, not my role alone. A huge team led by Dr. Mani, Dr. Brabija, and uh, Dr. Shafi, and a huge team of from uh, mixed geriatrician and allied health nursing. So uh, I think it was the key of succeed here in Qatar, working as close team. So um, after we invited uh, to be part of GDO, and this happened after the first ministerial. So all the minister of public health they meet to speak about dementia. And for me, it was really a great event. Uh, this happened March 2015. Uh, WHO request from each country to nominate focal points. So for uh, uh, for me, I was the focal point nominated by Her Excellency, our Minister of Public Health. Then we moved to November 2015 when we established uh, um, uh, our team and we start to uh, respond to WHO, uh, I remember around 26 indicator. And uh, believe me, you know, when I start to answer the indicator, almost 95% zero, zero, we don't have anything except memory clinic. And little bit was depressing for me, but Alhamdulillah, we progressed from that part. Um, Her Excellency authorized the dementia stakeholder as ministerial level. Uh, so working group under um, uh, assistant minister, Dr. Salih al Merri, which get, get the credit for this program. If there are any country, a stakeholder and minister level, they, they host this program, so empower this program. By June 2016, uh, our working group national formulate subgroup working at the level of our uh, hospital and our corporate with our colleague in primary healthcare. Uh, then we start to add uh, wine corner and more academic and uh, Dr. Omar and the team. Uh, February 2017, we start to build more relation. Now we build relation with Alzheimer's Disease International 
and uh, we present in, uh, in Indonesia at that time and more relation with the international body. Um, I face a problem for to decide the incidence of a problem here in Qatar to convince, you know, more infrastructure and build the capacity uh, because, uh, you know, if the patient coming with dementia, they will label him as uh, diabetic hypertension, uh, for example, but dementia will not be in the diagnosis part. So I thought, let me start with a small guideline in our hospital, then move to national uh, dementia guideline. So by 2017, we draft with my team a uh, dementia guideline. And on that dementia guideline, uh, our target really to standardize uh, the approach and the care of dementia patient, early diagnosis, and on the same time, increase the awareness. By uh, December 2017, um, uh, WHO um, recognized Qatar work, and uh, we chosen to to be to to show our work and um, to to do presentation and technical meeting. Uh, myself and Victor Many attended that meeting, and it was really good experience. Uh, so we managed to launch Qatar. National Dementia Plan 2018 by Her Excellency, our Minister of Public Health, Dr. Hanan Mohamed Al Khawari. And it considered the uh, first Arab country to have Dementia Plan. And what I, I'm proud about it, really, we uh, take a framework for Dementia, uh, uh, WHO Dementia Guideline, uh, GDO, Global Dementia Framework, but we have uh, Qatar context. And we tailor it for our population and culture-wise here in Qatar. It was really in our consideration. Our action area aligned with WHO, the first action area, dementia as a public health priority. Second uh, area, dementia awareness and differentness. The third, dementia risk reduction. Uh, fourth one, dementia diagnosis, treatment, uh, care, and support. Uh, uh, the fifth one, support for our uh, carer. Uh, who's care for uh, dementia patient. Um, uh, number six, uh, information system for dementia and which is include database, uh, registry, um, incident, prevalence of the problem. And the last one, and again, thank you all for, uh, and Dr. Amar for uh, this collaboration, dementia research and innovation. So I will take you point by point and uh, for each context uh, regarding dementia as a public health priority, uh, we managed to launch our dementia plan. Alhamdulillah, we launched national guidelines. So as I mentioned, I've start with corporate or hospital guideline, and we do have here in Qatar national uh, guideline contribution from uh, government and from private sector in addition to our NGO, Ihsan, and we never forget our carer. So two caregiver contribute to our guideline. Um, we managed to draft elderly law uh, for uh, elderly, and this was very sensitive part here in, uh, in, uh, in Arabic uh, country, and especially here in Qatar, but we managed to draft the law. Uh, we have work in progress regarding dementia assessment in driving. And I'm sure, you know, it's a big area of challenge. Regarding awareness, uh, we have ongoing awareness and um, the lead for this one, Dr. Mani Chandra, really he's doing just tremendous work on leading the country and breaking the stigma with the community. We managed to have a training for our nursing through AGI. And we have a training for our colleague, primary health care, uh, our target to train all of them in a 3D, dementia, depression, and delirium. Um, uh, regarding uh, awareness, we have this month um, uh, awareness with uh, our colleague in Oman, Alzheimer Association. And um, I'm proud to announce that the voice of patients was there. So 72 years, Kachari, uh, experience his living with Alzheimer and how much the health with the patient caregiver contribute to his progress of disease. Um, uh, this very important because stigma in, in Qatar is huge. So this means that we manage to break our stigma. We are here today. We're coming our colleague, Professor John Hardy from UK. 
and uh, Professor Henry Brodati, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, our nursing, they are doing a huge job of awareness across uh, our Hamad Medical Corporate, which almost around six, 16 hospitals. Qatar turned on bearable on World Alzheimer uh, Month. And uh, really, I contribute the thanks to our communication department. So if you see Qatar on that day, just bearable. And um, uh, this is sort of awareness and community ask why this color, why change the hotels, Qatar Museum, uh, uh, Cornish Street. Um, so this is part of awareness uh, increase, increase awareness. Risk reduction, <clears throat> since WHO they launched last May, their risk reduction guide, I take it very serious to Ministry of Public Health, because as you are aware, and uh, my colleague, they will contribute more than me, reducing the dementia uh, uh, factor, a preventive measure, uh, and uh, since there is no complete cure for dementia. So um, we managed here in Qatar to draft our guide. Uh, it's difficult for the team to read all the guides for WHO, so we summarize it with contribution from WHO to have our guide. Um, we have our healthy agent guide. It's part of national health strategy, and this guide uh, really focused on health of the brain. And we will launch it tomorrow, on 1st October, elderly day. Um, Dr. Biju, he's leading country for a wellness clinic program. And uh, our target, the patient complex uh, cases, uh, providing uh, them assessment. Uh, it's multidisciplinary clinic in, uh, input from dietitian, uh, Dr. Biju. Uh, Dr. Anura, she's um, um, from public health and specialized in wellness, of course, with uh, exercise program. Uh, maybe next time we meet uh, together, we can update you the outcome of this initiative. Um, dementia diagnosis and treatment care. Um, we face a problem in country using mini mental uh, tests or MOCA. Uh, with the level of education we have in the country, it was rigged, a big dynamic and uh, huge obstacle we face. So we thought, why would not develop our own uh, uh, assessment tool? And the work with Edinburgh uh, AC Qatar um, developed uh, this September, and it's under pilot stage. And really, uh, we thank uh, our team in UK helping Qatar and journey of dementia. Uh, we find, as I mentioned, there is a stigma regarding the presence of memory clinic in secondary level and Romela Hospital. So we thought, why we are not going to the community? We managed to open four memory clinic and primary health care. So I moved the team to the community. More cases, you know the outcome that more cases registered uh, and er more early diagnosis. Um, we have work in progress um, uh, for our National Memory Assessment Center. And during COVID, um, my team, very active. They are working even during COVID. And COVID was positive for our program. We managed to open uh, a telephone uh, helpline and virtual helpline for our elderly. And it was Really, our dream to have virtual consultation, but during the COVID, it happened. We managed to have elderly daycare for those elder, it's medical daycare. It's not a sort of vocational daycare. So, any dementia patient with behavioral problem, they can come to this unit. It's available daily. So, this is outcome positive for, for COVID for us. And um, we open an acute assessment unit in secondary level. So, uh, you know, uh, those patients, they need uh, environment uh, more quite than uh, acute tertiary hospital, and they need a trained multidisciplinary team. Uh, we opened also observation units, so our patient, they will not transfer to tertiary hospital. And I'm proud to announce that Qatar delivering the uh, medication to our elderly love during COVID, uh, but um, alhamdulillah, we managed to sustain it post-COVID. I mean, in spite now, we are a new normal. We have this initiative, delivering medication. Um, for our uh, carer, uh, we launched during COVID, Raha. Uh, Raha means in Arabic, relieving. So we call it National Alzheimer and Neurosurface Helpline, available daily, morning shift, except weekend. 
We are in final stage of uh, announcing our uh, Alzheimer disease um, uh, or Alze Qatar Alzheimer Association. And uh, after that, we will be uh, officially uh, registered through uh, Alzheimer uh, Disease Society. Um, um, we have, in addition to uh, dementia helpline, help we have elderly helpline. So if they are really not diagnosed as dementia, we can capture them. Um, regarding information system, as I mentioned, we don't have before registry here in Qatar. So we uh, submit our proposal to uh, a research center and we have fun uh, regarding our registry. So dementia registry on board coming soon and it will help really strategy maker and uh, policy uh, maker to uh, direct the country and uh, understand the size of problem in the country. Uh, Qatar UK Delphic is soon, it will launch. We are in final stage. It's collaboration uh, between Qatar and uh, UK, uh, US uh, University. Um, Cornell uh, and Dr. Omar leading Cornell Confocal Microscopy uh, Research is collaboration between us and the academic. And we conduct, um, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Professor Michael, he will uh, contribute to this today, about uh, community survey. I'm not advising any country to do what I did, but really I was in dynamic. I want to understand size of problem. So we went to the community to study. Um, uh, it was around 1,000 sample uh, and screen them. So any, any, uh, any elderly coming to primary health care for chronic disease, We'll uh, invite them to this uh, survey and we'll do screening for them. It, it was a uh, medical type uh, screening. So um, in the future, I'm not encouraging any country to do it, but in that time, it was the only way for me to understand the size problem in Qatar. Um, I welcome um, you again. Thank you, Dr. Amar. Thank you, Dr. George, for your uh, introduction. Professor Hardy uh, and uh, Professor Henry, thank you for uh, support today. And uh, Professor Michael, as usual, always support to elderly services. So I want to finish my call today. The future you see is the future you get. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hanadi, for your warm welcome. Uh, also, it's really very interesting to see all the great job you have done through the last uh, eight years or so under your leadership, congratulations uh, from, you know, all the challenges that you have overcome and now into being the first Arab country to have a dementia plan. So well done, congratulations, Dr. Hanadi. I would like now to move uh, to the next uh, speaker. Uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Omar El Aknaf, who is a pioneer in the field of neurodegenerative diseases who has received eight international awards, and additionally, he's executive director of the Qatar Biomedical Research Institute at Hamad bin Khalifa University. Over the past 20 years, his research group has positioned itself at the forefront of neuroscience research internationally. Currently serves on the editorial boards of several international journals. In this special occasion, Dr. Omar will share an overview of the Qatar's biomedical research and dementia research opportunities. Uh, welcome, Dr. Omar. The floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, George, uh, for the uh, kind introduction and the kind words. I uh, also would like to thank uh, Dr. Hanadi and her team for again, for you know the great efforts that be, she's been doing and putting together uh, the the um, uh, efforts from HMC clinical side and again putting bringing together researchers from academia and research institutes to work and try to tackle one of the challenges that hasn't been uh, given uh, much attention in the in this uh, part of the world. Um, thank you for the organizers, George and uh, Dr. Mani, and the uh, many behind the scenes organized this uh, meeting. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank very much our guest speakers, Professor Henry uh, and Professor John Hardy for uh, joining us at this event. And we're looking forward and excited to hear uh, the latest and the uh, findings and recommendations from their uh, uh, expertise. 
Uh, today, I'm going to uh, to share with you an overview of Qatar Biomedical Research Institute and dementia research opportunities that we have been established since we uh, started the uh, 2016, 2017, and with the effort of uh, many colleagues uh, and um, um, okay, many colleagues, uh, we managed to put the great effort. Before I do that, I just like to uh, give you overview on Kibai. Uh, Kibai research priorities uh, aligned with the Qatar National Research Strategy as we selected uh, the the uh, diseases those are more important for Qatar including diabetes infectious diseases cancer cardiovascular diseases neuroscience genetics sp uh, sport health I to uh, focus on the uh, areas that uh, uh, relevant and uh, to, uh, to to the Qatar population, including diabetes, for good reason, as you know, most of our population is Qatar in the region uh, affected by diabetes type two. Uh, we focus also we uh, on cancer. We selected cancer specifically, uh, breast cancer. That uh, it is quite unique for the Arab region that affect uh, uh, our young uh, Arab women ten years. Compared younger compared to the rest of the world. Also, uh, we also uh, focus on neurological disorders, where I will give you more overview on, on our uh, research center focus on the in the, in the brain related disease. Recently, we started a small program focus on infectious diseases. So, Kibari has established uh, uh, research centers focus on this area we identify. Uh, Diabetes Research Center, which is one of the biggest and uh, important research center under the umbrella of Kibari. Uh, the second uh, center, which is now it's restructuring the center, is a cancer and infectious disease. We will give it a name very soon, but it will be focused on breast cancer and infectious diseases together. And the third research center is a neurological disorder research center, which is the the only uh, research center in the, in the region that uh, does basic and clinical uh, research uh, uh, related research uh, focus on brain related diseases for uh, affecting young children as well as elderly uh, people and I will tell you more later so for those research center we also established the state of the art um, core facilities to support our uh, scientists in the three research centers. We established stem cell core facility, the only one available in the in the region. Uh, we have a genomic and a genome technology uh, core facility, which is really state of the art. Um, uh, also, we have a sexual biology core facility, the only one available in the um, in Qatar, uh, there's another one in the region which is based in the coast in uh, Saudi Arabia. We have advanced flow cytometry core, we have advanced microscopy and imaging, as well as we establish uh, a really advanced proteomics uh, core facility for our biomarker discovery. And also we uh, start uh, uh, clinical research core that hosts all our clinical samples and data uh, we, we uh, generate from the uh, um, our research. So we're focusing on the neurological disorder research center, which is NDRC uh, under uh, KBRI. This center, as I mentioned, is really focusing on two uh, um, uh, main uh, uh, diseases that are affecting uh, uh, kids, like neurodevelopmental disorders, including uh, autism, uh, intellectual disability, epilepsy. Also, this center uh, engaged in the uh, the diseases that affect elderly people, including Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Themes which is covered by our NDRC, including epidemiology to define the incidence and prevalence uh, of the uh, autism. We managed to conduct the first uh, prevalence study on autism in the, in the region and has been published uh, last year and has great impact for our healthcare uh, um, system as well as education and uh, show it the, the, the uh, real uh, uh, numbers that uh, affected by autism in Qatar and possibly would be similarity in the, the region. 
We also, this feeling of trying to understand the molecular mechanism behind the, that cause uh, uh, neurodevelopmental uh, using genomic approach, also stem cell approach and so on. So uh, we, we, we really have a strong team working in, the, uh, in this uh, area to identify and understand more of these uh, the, uh, uh, spectrum. Um, we have a strong interest in the identification of novel biomarkers either uh, for diagnosis, prognosis, or uh, drug response uh, for uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, specifically autism, and in neurodegenerative diseases, uh, uh, we focus mainly in dementia as well as Parkinson's disease. Um, we have recently, uh, under QBRI, launched uh, 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 a program that focuses on, on the um, diabetes with complications. And in this case, we look at diabetes with complications, including dementia, stroke, and cardiovascular disease, in collaboration with, uh, with a team uh, with Dr. Riaz Malik from Cornell, uh, Qatar, as well as uh, Dr. Hanadi and Dr. Mani from HMC, we collecting uh, you know, cohort to study uh, the, the, the uh, see uh, the relationship between diabetes and dementia, and can we identify a biomarker? So the approach is a multidisciplinary approach. We're involving different uh, scientists with different um, expertise from uh, our three research centers, as well as uh, expert uh, experts from other colleges or other university, as well as clinicians, uh, clinicians like neurologists, geriatrician. Um, Technologies and so on to work together uh, in this under uh, interdisciplinary program to identify uh, diagnostic markers using proteomics, proteomics, genomics, or different kind of omics. So the the latest technology available and now all of it in under KBRI, hoping that to develop uh, you know markers that to identify diabetes type two. Those are at high risk of developing dementia. The, the samples are in progress. We're collecting uh, over 100 samples now, uh, and uh, hopefully by the end of this year, we'll start the screening using our uh, uh, omics technologies and identify, uh, trying to identify potential markers. This uh, collaboration, as I mentioned, uh, uh, it's really um, um, uh, um, uh, real collaboration between Cornell Medicine. Uh, Qatar with Dr. Riaz Manik and his team, Dr. Hanadi and Dr. Mani team, as well as Kibari uh, working together on, the, on this project was funded now by, uh, by um, QNRF, uh, Qatar National Research Fund, as well as by funded by KBI. Uh, the phase one, which is led by Dr. Riaz Manik, is, is uh, already published, and he's an expert in this uh, uh, area where we try to, um, you know, using the, the, the um, uh, confocal microscopy, coronal confocal microscopy to identify uh, or uh, uh, as a marker for the uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And he has shown excellent data to, uh, to differentiate between control, MCI, and dementia. Really great work. And that's the phase one. And um, in phase two, actually, we, we're going to move on. This is number, number two year study where we, we will follow those patients for over three years. And then uh, with the technology developed by uh, Dr. Yasmanik, we will move with KBRI using the, as I mentioned earlier, omics, where uh, proteomics, metabolomics, and other omics will be used. The mention of the bodies uh, in collaboration with many international research groups in the world, from Europe, from USA, Canada, Japan, over uh, all over uh, the globe, where we have our group developed uh, a, a unique technology, unique assays for um, uh, detecting uh, pathogenic species related or uh, markers related to early diagnosis. Uh, and uh, also prognosis of, of uh, uh, dementia with Lewy body and Parkinson's disease and other related disorders. Also, KBRI team engaged in the um, uh, consortium led by uh, um, uh, A. McKeith from Newcastle University, where they meet every uh, few years, uh, uh, four years, to uh, update, uh, you know, the the the, the um, uh, diagnose, uh, diagnose and management of dementia recommendations for Lewy bodies, uh, and uh, that's really important, uh, you know, guidelines 
uh, for uh, for the for the physicians and help and update what the latest and uh, finding related to diagnosis and management of uh, lupus. Uh, with dementia. So, thank you so much for, for your attention. And uh, again, once again, thank you, um, our collaborators uh, from Cornell, Dr. Riaz Malik, from HMC, from Dr. Hanadi, and Dr. Mani. Uh, once again, I would like to thank our guests, uh, Dr. Henry and Dr. John Harvey, for joining us uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Omar, for such a great presentation. It's really exciting to see how your contribution is uh, towards the science, you know, through research. And also in the way you have explained it, the, how the research program works, uh, very easy and friendly. Thank you very much again. We will now move to our next speaker. So it's my privilege to introduce the first keynote speaker, Professor John Hardy. Uh, welcome, Professor John Hardy. Uh, he will be talking about genomic analysis of neurodegenerative disease implicates failures of damage repair. Professor Hardy is the chair of the Molecular Biology of Neurological Disease at the Reta Lila Weston Institute of Neurological Studies, University College London, and a member of the UK Dementia Research Institute. He is a leader in the genetic analysis of Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementias. And is holding a postdoctoral research at the MRC Neuropathogenesis Unit in the UK, among many other achievements. Professor Hardy, whose discoveries in genetic mutations have impacted dramatically the understanding of neurodegenerative diseases has been awarded with the Breakthrough Prize in 2015 and the Brain Prize for groundbreaking research on the genetic and molecular basis of Alzheimer's disease in 2018. Please, Professor Hardy, the audience is yours and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for this uh, generous invitation and thanks for that nice introduction. Nice for me also to see Omar, after so long, uh, uh, I, I came to Qatar SP 12 years ago. It would have been very nice to come there again today if it weren't for the COVID times. It's cold here in London today, and the idea of coming to, to Qatar is, uh, would have been very appealing, I have to say. And I had a great time there uh, looking at the Museum of Arab Culture and so on. It was really a pleasant time, a great place. I hope you're well and staying out of COVID. I just looked up the COVID statistics for Qatar just as I was uh, preparing now, and you're not doing too bad. You're not doing too bad. So keep up the good work. Keep up the good work. It's really a difficult time for the world. So I'm going to talk about all neurodegenerative diseases. Um, we've been, I'm very lucky in a way. Uh, working at uh, the Institute of Neurology, we have um, experts across the board in all neurodegenerative diseases. We have a great Alzheimer team now led by Nick Fox, a Parkinson team which used to be led by Andrew Lees, but is now led by Tom Faulkney, Hugh Morris, and Kailash Bhatia, a really good team, and an ALS FTD team led by Pietro Fratter and John Rora. So. I'm very fortunate. I'm not a clinician, but I'm surrounded by very good clinicians. And that means that uh, we have been able to work on all neurodegenerative diseases rather than just a single neurodegenerative disease. And I think that that's given us unique insights across the board um, uh, about these diseases because we are able to make comparisons about the risk for risks for all of them. So the majority of my lecture is going to be on Alzheimer's disease. But towards the end, I'm going to draw some general lessons about all of the other diseases. And I'll now start to share my screen. So I'm going to talk about all of the neurodegenerative diseases. I'll focus mainly on Alzheimer's disease, uh, but I'll talk about uh, the others as well, as I said. 
So I'll quickly go through the pathology of the diseases. This is Alzheimer's disease. Here in the middle, uh, here at the bottom, you see plaques. This is about a tenth of a millimeter across, and this is made up of the amyloid peptide. Here you see tangles in the cortex. These are in pyramidal neurons in the cortex. And here you see blood vessels surrounded by amyloid. Here you see the gross pathology with this enlarged uh, ventricle. Uh, and, uh, you know, clearly uh, there's been tissue loss. If you look here, here is the hippocampus in cross section. This should be much bigger than this. So these, these are, this is the gross pathology of the disease. And of course, when you see the pathology like this, you don't know what the order of the pathology has been. You see all of this really a disaster, but you don't know what part of that pathology came first. And that's why I was keen to study genetics. Here, because that gives you, in certain cases at least, where the disease starts. Here is the pathology of Parkinson's disease. Uh, and here are the microscopic change. Well, here is the substantia nigra. And you can see that this is very pale here. This is what it should be like. So you've lost dopamine neurons here. And here are Lewy bodies, both in the cortex. Um, and this often would be in dementia with Lewy bodies, which Amara's just mentioned. And here is uh, a Lewy body in the substantia nigra. And these are, <clears throat> these are made up of the protein alpha synucleum. So this is the pathology of Parkinson's disease. And here now is the pathology of one of the diseases with tangles, progressive supranuclear palsy. Uh, here you see the, uh, the, 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 the degeneration here. This should be much larger here. Uh, so you can see that there is gross cell loss here as well as in the dentate nucleus and here in the cerebellum. And when you look at the pathology, you see these tau tangles. This is a sporadic disease, but there are mutations which I'll talk about, which give rise to a very similar uh, autosomal dominant disease. So these are the are overall the, the things that I'm going to be talking about in the pathology. And the, the point from these three pathology slides is that in all of them, you get protein deposition. In Alzheimer's disease, you get amyloid and tangles, tau. In Parkinson's disease, you get synuclein. And in, in the, fr the frontotemporal dementia and progressive supranuclear palsy, you get tangles. And really, there's a remarkable similarity, which is how I'm going to start. In all of them, there are rare families uh, where the disease is caused by duplications of the gene which uh, encode the protein which is deposited. So here you see a finding that we made a few years ago showing that in Parkinson's disease, one way of getting it is rare families with autosomal dominant gene, well, in this case, triplications. So these people who got Parkinson's disease when they were 30, these people who got the disease when they were 30, these people had, in fact, four copies of the synuclein gene instead of the two copies that all of us on this uh, conference will have, I hope. Uh, so these people had got four copies. So they're depositing the protein simply because they're making too much of it. And there are families with three copies and those families get sick typically in their 50s. Then this paper from, um, from Dominic Campion showed that individuals with the amyloid gene duplicated got Alzheimer's disease when they were 50, in their 50s. And so these people are simply depositing uh, amyloid because they've got one extra copy of the gene. And I'm sure, as many of you know, people with Down syndrome who've got three copies of chromosome 21 and the amyloid gene is on chromosome 21, 
those people will get uh, Alzheimer's disease in their 40s and 50s. And then Campion also showed that people with Tangle or, and or some people with autosomal dominant Tangle disease, uh, those people have got an, a duplication of the tau gene. NAPT stands for micro associated protein tau. So that's the that's the gene for the tau protein. So you can see that overproduction of all of these proteins is one way of getting the disease. And these proteins are actually uh, very highly expressed proteins. They're, they're very highly expressed. And there's a very interesting paper which influenced my view on things from Michelle Vendrascola, who pointed out that all of these proteins, the ones I've just mentioned, are all close to their solubility limits. So all of them uh, are close to being deposited. And so having extra copies mean that they will be uh, deposited. I'll just add to this that, in fact, the APP, there are other APP mutations, and those APP mutations uh, make the, uh, the amyloid peptide less soluble. So they also fit with this idea. They, uh, most of them don't lead to more, pep, more amyloid peptide being made but they lead to the amyloid peptide that is made being less soluble. And there are other tau mutations that we found which increase the proportion of one of the isoforms of tau. Uh, and so those are also consistent. So there are many autosomal dominant cases of disease which are also consistent with this idea of overproduction. This point, in a way, was first made by Glenner in 1984, and he made it specifically with regard to Down syndrome. And the last, the last sentence of his abstract here, assuming the amyloid peptide is a human gene product, suggests the genetic defect on Alzheimer's disease is on chromosome 21. So he first suggested in 1984 that the reason that people get Alzheimer's disease in Down syndrome is because they made too much amyloid. Now, we came to the story with this family. This is a family that um, we, Martin Rosser uh, and I, collected in Nottingham in England. Uh, and uh, this family has a grandfather here with Alzheimer's disease, age of onset 55, two sons, also age of onset of 55, those two sons married two sisters. And then this, fa this family had 10 children, five of whom got Alzheimer's disease. And this family had three children, one of whom got Alzheimer's disease. And what you're looking at is the top, the inheritance of the top half of chromosome 21. And you can see that the five affect all of the affected individuals inherit the whole chromosome, but these two unaffected and in, unaffected individuals have got these parts of the chromosomes, and that tells you the disease gene is between here and here, and the amyloid gene was right in the middle of that gap. And when we sequenced the gene, we found the mutation. So this really was the basis of the amyloid hypothesis for the disease. The disease started, at least in this family, with amyloid. Then <clears throat> Peter Hislop, uh, the, our, the amyloid mutations are rather rare, uh, but, pe uh, but the majority of families with early onset disease had, an, had mutations somewhere else in the genome and that was discovered by Peter Hislop, who found the gene presenilin. And the presenilin protein is shown here. It's a complicated protein with, with a, uh, one, two, three, I'm forgetting how many transmembrane domains it has. Uh, nine transmembrane domains. And you can see in blue here. Uh, and when it was cloned, when it was identified by Peter, we did not know what its function was, but afterwards 
because of work by my colleague Bart de Struper and Dennis Selko, it was realized that this uh, protein was actually the protein responsible for cleaving the amyloid protein. And all the residues in red here are residues in which we and others have found mutations which cause the disease. So the important thing about this is that, that uh, mutations in amyloid can cause disease and mutations in the gene which encodes the protein which metabolizes the amyloid precursor protein can also cause the disease. And that really led us to this idea that in, in the autosomal dominant forms of the disease, all of the mutations make amyloid de deposition more likely by leading to more amyloid production or the production of a less soluble amyloid. Now, we and others showed that was true in cell models and in animal models. Uh, but Randy Bateman in St. Louis showed that this was also true in families with the mutation carriers. So this is really how the, what causes the disease in the rare early onset forms of the disease. And this led us to this simple idea, the amyloid hypothesis, which says that basically the disease started starts with amyloid production and that leads to all of the other things. Now we drew this diagram as you can see in 1998 uh, and it still I, I think uh, got some validity but there are a lot of problems with this diagram and I think it, we should go over what those problems are. The first problem is these question marks here which we drew in 1998 are still here and really if the question I mean the, that's really a worry it, it was okay to have question marks in 1998 but 23 years later to still have the same question marks is a concern the second thing that's worrying or probably wrong in fact is we drew this here this we envisaged as the neuronal membrane implying that amyloid outside a neuron cause tangles inside the neuron. So we really envisage this entirely as a process of neurons. And as I'll discuss later, that seems, I think that that was wrong. The next thing that's a worry is that I've drawn this like a biochemical pathway. And biochemical pathways like glycolysis and so on, and the urea cycle, all of those things, those biochemical pathways operate over seconds. In the glycolysis, if you change the glucose concentration, your glycolytic flux happens, changes in seconds. And we now know through, um, uh, through uh, studies following people over time, that this process takes 20 years. So it's a very much longer process than this implies. And I think that also is a problem. Let's look at amyloid processing. Here it is. Uh, here is the amyloid precursor protein here. Here is the enzyme beta secretase cutting here and then presenilin gamma secretase here yielding amyloid. Now I've drawn the uh, uh, thinacrid and kudru amyloid going off into the extracellular space uh, but uh, and I think that's incorrect and I'll come back to that and that's this is then the amyloidogenic pathway. This is the other pathway with alpha secretase here cleaving here and not yielding amyloid. So these are the pathways by which amyloid is made. Now, as we've started to look in late onset Alzheimer's disease, one of the things that have turned up, and Rudy Tanzi was the first to show this, was that mutations in alpha secretase can also increase your risk of disease. So mutations in this enzyme here, uh, which therefore reduce this flux, 
um, uh, increase your risk. So that also is consistent with the amyloid hypothesis. And mutations which reduce amyloid production reduce your incidence of Alzheimer's disease. This is a paper from Decode. They showed that a mutation here which reduced this cleavage reduced both amyloid production and your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. So also consistent. But I emphasize that these are extremely rare uh, variants as well. All very good, all consistent then with the amyloid hypothesis. But, you know, look at the uh, amyloid therapies which have been tried. We've tried inhibit, I say we, this was Lily in fact, tried inhibiting gamma secretase, presenilin, the patients got worse, tried inhibiting beta secretase, that also didn't work. Helping uh, clear amyloid from the brain or really helping prevent amyloid deposition also did not help, uh, and that's these. And although we still have some help, hope for this um, process, um, it's still in, in uh, fo experimental follow-up, um, really, you know, this is a, this, these failures, even though the science appears to be good, are a concern. Um, we don't really know what the problems are, but I think we, all of us in the field, believe that one of the problems is that, that is we have got the time scale wrong. This is a famous curve which everyone who goes to Alzheimer meetings will see many times. It was drawn by Cliff Jack. And here, these are biomarkers for disease. This is when a patient, let's say this is 70 years old, this is when a man is brought to the to the, his neurologist by his wife and because she thinks he's losing his memory and uh, therefore, you know, and the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is probably then made around here. Uh, but by that time, these biomarkers, CSF amyloid, amyloid in the pet, and all of these other biomarkers are maxed out because these started to change 15 or 20 years before the disease. So if you give an anti-amyloid drug here, the amyloid is already maxed out. So the explanation we give, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's the one that is popular, is that they might be the right drugs that we've been trying, but we're trying them too late. It's rather like someone having a, a heart attack and us rushing up and giving them a statin. Might, statin might have been the right drug, but while somebody is having a heart attack, it's no good. That's the conventional explanation. <clears throat> I don't know if it's true, uh, but it is the conventional and it is a plausible explanation. And what this is telling us, and this is true for all of the diseases, I think, is that we need to get better at diagnosing, and this holds for the Parkinson's disease and the tauopathies as well. We want to get better at diagnosing these diseases early. And that's gonna require a mixture of genetics, perhaps uh, uh, to help with making early diagnosis and biomarker work. You know, we need to get better at identifying people before they have clinical symptoms. Now, what happens, what I've been talking about in respect to Alzheimer's disease is true for those few families, maybe 1% of cases, true for Down syndrome, uh, but 99% of cases, it is, it is, those are not the causes. Now, through genome-wide association studies, we can identify risk loci, and this is one of the um, uh, um, more recent studies. And you can see what we're doing here is a genome-wide association study. What we're doing here, here, these are the chromosomes along here. This is the statistical significance here. We're testing thousands of SNPs across the genomes across the genome for association with disease. 
APOE here is easily the biggest risk factor. We've known about that since Alan, Alan Rose's group discovered it in the 90s, but these have all come out of these genome-wide association studies. And rather than just give you a list of genes, because actually now there's about 50 of them, <clears throat> it's clear that we should, we're beginning to understand what the genes do. And what the genes do, and this was the first paper to make this point, they're nearly all involved in the innate immune system. And by the innate immune system, we largely, perhaps not exclusively, largely mean uh, microglia, and they are largely, many of them are involved in, well, I'm not going to say cholesterol metabolism, I'm going to say lipid metabolism. So some of them are involved in APP processing, uh, but the majority are more involved in lipid metabolism and um, the, in, the uh, in, I'm going to say, microglia. Just illustrating this with the first ones which were discovered, and you can see APOE, lipid metabolism, clustering, lipid metabolism, and innate immunity. PCAM is probably APP processing. ABCA7, lipid metabolism. CR1, innate immunity. BIN1, probably APP processing. And MS4AE, innate immunity. So, and this, I'm just giving these as examples. The same, the same sorts of things are true for the majority of these loci. Now, at this time, we we had been we have been very keen to look for recessive uh, recessive causes of dementia, and this is something that you might also be interested in in the Qatari population, where you have consanguineous marriages. Uh, we had, with um, uh, Mura Emery and Eber Lohman, been collecting families in Turkey which were cousin marriages. And here you can see three uh, young men. These are people in their 30s who are, the, who are from consanguineous families, and they have got a dementing disease in their 30s, although their parents were unaffected. And when we did exome sequencing in these families, we found mutations in TREM2. <clears throat> the mutations we found were Q33X, T66M, Y38C. Uh, you can see this is a curious disease and it had this title. And the reason we gave it this title is that this gene had been found by Lena Pelton and years before in people with a similar disease, but with bone involvement. And so we had not suspected the same disease because our, her cases had had um, a Paget's disease and our cases did not. So that explains the title. But when we looked, we, what, when you find mutations uh, and you're doing exome or genome sequences, sequencing, what you do is you look to see if you've ever seen those those mutations in any other context. And when we <clears throat> looked in our large Alzheimer's series, which were about a thousand cases and a thousand controls, we found the same mutations. Once T66M in a case and not in the control, Q Y38C three times in cases and not in controls, Q33X twice in cases and not in controls, so these mutations had occurred six times in cases and not in control. Remember that in the Turkish families, they were homozygous. Here, they were heterozygous, so only one mutant allele. But even more interesting, this mutation here, R47H, 22 times in cases and five times in controls, suggesting that these variants were four times more prevalent in Alzheimer's cases than in controls. And this is our paper describing these findings. At the same time, the decode group reported the last mutation, that R47H, uh, in the Icelandic population. And when we wrote this up, I got a letter from Tom Bird, who pointed out to me that he'd actually <coughs> made the same observation 30 years earlier. 
he had found a family with this same rare disease that we had seen in Turkey. He'd given it this terrible name. And he had noted here, your plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, that some cases in the family had Alzheimer's disease. So he had made the same observation, uh, although at that time, the gene TREM2 had not been uh, discovered. So TREM2 is therefore a risk gene. Now, at the same time we were doing this experiment, looking for genetic causes, we were, we'd also made mice which were depositing amyloid because they got amyloid uh, uh, variants. And we were looking at the effects of gene, on gene expression. And really, uh, and it, this was an entirely independent set of experiments. We found that TREM2 was the gene which went up the most in response to amyloid. So here we're finding the gene by genetic means, sequencing, but through these experiments in mice, we find that TREM2 is the gene which responds the most to amyloid deposition. So we followed that up by looking at what other genes um, uh, uh, respond to amyloid deposition. And our paper is this paper here, uh, uh, and it's on, at a website called Mousiac. If you want to look online, you can look at this data online. And here's mouse age, and here's TREM2 going up in response to amyloid deposition. So we did a correlative analysis. What you do here is you look and you say, what other genes go up at the same time as TREM2? And here is that correlative analysis. Here's TREM2. All of these other genes go up in response uh, to amyloid, though not as much as TREM2. And really remarkably, those in circles here are also genome-wide association hits that have been published. Uh, so in other words, it isn't just TREM2 that's amyloid responsive. These other genes which are, are upregulated in the mice in response to amyloid deposition. And in fact, the next gene which was described was this gene here. So it was predictive of other Alzheimer risk genes. So we could predict risk genes by simply looking at those genes which responded to amyloid. And my colleague Dervis Saleh uh, did this in uh, did this uh, looking in systematically at those genes which were amyloid responsive. He asked these questions. Is there an overrepresentation of amyloid responsive genes? Yes, P10 to the minus 41. Even if we take out the ones we already know about, is it still significant? And the answer was still yes. So which other genes are there? And here is that amyloid response module. Again, here's trend two. Here's the other genes which have now been described. And here are the other genes which are also statistically significantly associated with disease. So there is therefore a microglial amyloid response network and genetic variability in many of the uh, components of that network are increase your risk of disease. And here they are, OAS1, and we know that that is involved in cytokine regulation. These two genes, GAL3ST4 and LAPTM4, 5, uh, are used, uh, have been used by histologists because if you use them in, on, uh, as, a, as a stain on the brain, on the, they light up microglia around plaques. CXCL10 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And HLA is, uh, had been previously reported by others in a Finnish study. And then this gene here had been hypothesized by Alison Goat because it was a microglial response gene. So this, she had found previous evidence that this was important in disease. So what this is saying is that late onset disease is genetically uh, uh, variability in response to amyloid deposition. 
And again, this is the paper from Randy Bateman. I, I mentioned before that he had shown that early onset disease was over production of amyloid, uh, of longer amyloid species. But he also showed, and this is his paper making that point, that late onset disease is mainly a failure of clearance. And that is completely consistent with that. So this is the summary of what I've said. Early onset disease is amyloid production. Some of the late onset disease, but the majority is not. Uh, the majority of loci are involved in microglial and lipid metabolism, and they are amyloid responsive. So now, how can we put this together? What I've told you so far, I hope is fact. I, in these days of false, 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 what is it called? False facts. I hope that what I've told you so far is a fact. But now I'm going to make a hypothesis as what I think is going on. And that's based upon this type of work. These are the genes we've just mentioned. ABCA7 is a phospholipid transporter, and TREM2 is a phospholipid receptor. And they're microglial. And so what I'm suggesting, and this is only a suggestion, is that amyloid, remember in that diagram I showed amyloid being sent off into the extracellular space. But those of us who work with amyloid no, it's really sticky in lipids. And I suggest that what happens is that amyloid deposition begins in the neuronal membrane. And, its own, and when it is in the neuronal membrane, it disrupts those, the, the membrane. And here's the phospholipids. And it, that's what attracts the microglia. And they are, if you like, the dustbin men. They clear up the mess. And you only start to develop the disease when the dustbin men basically go on strike. Basically, you start to develop disease when you overwhelm your clearance. And this is why the whole process takes longer. So just to summarize Alzheimer's disease before I briefly go on to the other diseases, I see late onset disease largely as a failure of damage response. Now moving much more quickly onto the other diseases. These are the diseases that have uh, we've found now the Mendelian causes of Parkinson's disease. And what you can see, I won't go through all of them. Well, I'll mention synuclein first of all, which Omar has mentioned briefly already, and I showed was um, uh, uh, the major. I showed the data showing it was a major component of Lewy bodies, the majority of the cases, majority of these Mendelian genes are either involved in the endosome lysosome system or they're involved in mitophagy. Mitophagy is the process by which damaged mitochondria are sent to the lysosome. So these are the these are the um, these are the Mendelian causes of Parkinson's uh, disease. Um, again, a lot of these are recessives. And again, you might have some of these, I suspect you will have some of these patients in Qatar, uh, just by the way. Um, and I know, for example, that um, ATP 13A2 was described by Elahi Elahi in Iran. So, uh, you know, they, th that was, that's the case. Now, here we have the Parkinson GWAS, same type of data. I'm not going to go through it in detail, except to say many of the uh, loci are lysosomal or they're, or they're mitochondrial. So again, this is consistent with, with what I've already said about the Mendelian genes. And the most famous uh, Parkinson locus, in a way, is GBA. This is a homozygosity for GBA mutations, causes Gaucher's disease, and um, Alan Sidransky and others have shown that uh, heterozygosity, again, one mutant copy, not two, causes, uh, predisposes, increases your risk of getting Parkinson's disease. 
by about fivefold. So again, the life of oral isosome. And more, more generally, Laura Roback and Josh Schulman, as part of our international consortium, have shown that there is an excess of lysosome storage disease genes in Parkinson's disease. Now, how does this fit together? Well, there's this very interesting series of papers. I just show one of them from Dimitri Crank, showing that in fact, synuclein is metabolized through the lysosome. Synuclein is metabolized through the lysosome and overproduction of synuclein inhibits the lysosome. And so you have a, 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 a relationship, a direct relationship between lysosome function and synuclein deposition. And so by analogy with what I've said about amyloid, you can either get out, uh, Parkinson's disease by making too much synuclein or by having weak lysosomes, if you like, and failing to metabolize uh, the lysosome. I haven't had time and I won't have time to talk about the mitophagy, but I'll just say quickly that mitophagy involves clearance through the lysosome. So if you've got weak lysosomes, or if you've got problems in the mitophagy process, you can also uh, damage your dopamine neurons. So that is consistent. This side is consistent with what I've just said. So these are the, this is the summary for Parkinson's disease, too much synuclein or weak lysosome function or a mixture of both actually. Those, uh, 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 those of us who produce more synuclein and have marginally weak part, uh, lysosomes will be at increased risk of getting disease. And then finally, to move on to the tauopathies, we showed tau mutations caused autosomal dominant disease We've started to do GWAS for the sporadic diseases. These are rare, so we found far fewer genes. But what we're seeing is, again, clearance pathways, and particularly the ubiquitin proteasome pathway is, is, uh, is coming out of the risk uh, for the sporadic uh, uh, tauopathies. And interestingly, tau, is metabolized, as my colleague Karen Duff uh, showed, tau is metabolized in part through the proteasome. And so the same, same general, the same general principle. So in, in my overall suggestion, in all diseases, genetic overproduction leads to autosomal dominant diseases. In all diseases, some of the genes are involved in the clearance of those proteins. Uh, and nothing, there's, perhaps there's nothing intrinsically distinctive about these protein, proteins. They are just the highest expressed proteins of their disposal class. Now, I'll just say something about risk reduction, uh, since that's the topic of, the disease, of this. It used to be the case, still is the case to some extent, you used to go to conferences. Well, you used to go to conferences. That's the first thing to say. But you used to go to conferences and the people working on the molecular biology will be in one room and the people working on the epidemiology will be on, on, in another room and there'd be no connection. Those of us working on Alzheimer's disease like me would go to the sessions on amyloid production and amyloid toxicity and so forth. And the epidemiologist would be in the next room talking about risk factors. And there was no interaction because, uh, I mean, and it was difficult to see what, the, what, what was going on. But now I think we're beginning to see if, if it's damage, if, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, it's neuronal damage, then, of course, one of the risk reduction strategies we could be thinking about is reducing damage, damage reduction. And we heard in the first talk uh, about, uh, 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 um, da about damage. In the, in the introduction, we heard about a risk reduction and so on, and, and what strategies were being taken in Qatar. And it's really remarkable that um, although all the drug trials for Alzheimer's disease have failed, 
In fact, the incidence of disease has um, reduced um, over the last 30 years by about 30% in the West. And probably that is, if you like, an accidental effect, an accidental effect in a, in a way of better, uh, what I, I'll call heart health, reduction in smoking, rid, control of blood pressure and control uh, of, um, of cholesterol levels. And so I think that, uh, and I, one of the things I'll emphasize, which your introductory lecture also alluded to, is that uh, the first thing I think that can be done is to, is to really push further, even further, on the, uh, on the reduction of damage through heart health. And that, as I hope I've showed, may have a way of reducing Alzheimer damage because the problem is the failure in late onset disease often in damage response. So, so far the drug trials haven't worked. I hope that, you know, I hope that aducanumab does show some efficacy and we do better, but we have seen a reduction uh, in incidence. And, and I would really emphasize that this is something that uh, should be encouraged, of course, uh, to continue. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Professor Hardy, for this great presentation and for sharing your knowledge, your experience, and all your great papers with the audience and with the panelists, okay? Uh, I think your presentation was a good example of a real academic session. Thank you very much, okay? We say always that we learn one new thing every day, but I think with you more than one, definitely. It was a pleasure. It was Thank a pleasure. you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, I think there are some questions uh, from the audience. So next I will invite Dr. Omar uh, to moderate 10 minutes question and answer session. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Omar. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, again, thank you. Uh... Professor Hardy for this excellent uh, presentation. We always enjoy uh, your, uh, you know, uh, presentations and uh, your view on the latest findings and uh, where we should uh, focus. So there are several questions from the audience and uh, I'm trying to do my best to, um, you know, get, uh, I mean, uh, select uh, the, those ones might you know, uh, be interested to all audience. One of them uh, is uh, related to the, you know, the genetics work you've done. One of the um, question is in Turkish consequences, uh, families, Dr. Hardy found homozygous mutations in trim 2 Given that he found other heterozygous mutations of this gene in other non consequence with trim patient. Did the uh, heterozygous carrier, like the uh, like the parents of the homozygous patient, had any similar symptoms like Alzheimer's? Uh, we cannot no, hear you. I think you are muted, uh, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So that's a very good question, and in fact, I asked Murat Emery and uh, Eva Lohman, and the of course you saw that were three three families, so six parents. So were that, did those six parents get Alzheimer's disease? That's a very good question. And, but unfortunately, we can't really answer it. Two of them died quite young. So that gets you down to four. And then one of those four got dementia. But, you know, one in four elderly people is really not enough to make a... So we are continuing to look at that. That's a very good question. Um, excellent. Now, I mean, the, the other question related to TRIM2, I mean, um, how TRIM2 lead to Alzheimer's disease? Maybe we missed the, the point you tried to explain. And can we target it as a therapeutic for therapies? So, uh, so if you have a TRIM2 mutation, it increases your risk of getting disease by about fourfold. So it's a serious risk factor. But if you have a single TRAM2 mutation, it doesn't, it doesn't definitely mean you will get the disease, but it does increase your risk to a large extent. How can we use TRAM2 as 
um, as as a, 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 a target. Well, uh, it's actually difficult. One could imagine that stimulating the receptor somehow would be a good thing. The problem is that it, they're not responding. The trouble is that, as I showed with the diagram in a way, the job of TREM2 is to pull the microglia to the damage. And so it's got a directionality to it. And it's very difficult to think of how you could use a drug to make the microglia go to the right place. That's a difficult thing. I personally think a better strategy would be to understand the pathway beyond TREM2 and, if you like, amplify that pathway. In other words, to look at the pathway down from TREM2 and then try and, if you like, amplify that pathway. So use the TREM2. Remember, they've still got one TREM2. It's heterozygosity. They've still got some TREM2, just not enough. So make the pathway behind TREM2 work better. I think is a better strategy, but it's very difficult. Uh, many drug companies are trying though. Um, the other question which we got from our audience is, um, as you are one of the, um, you know, promoting the amyloid hypothesis for many, many years, do you still believe in amyloid hypothesis? <laughs> <coughs> well, let me just say that the amyloid hypothesis is not a religion. It's not a religion. You, you know, the point about being a scientist is if the data changes, you change your mind, of course. Now, I think if you could reduce amyloid production, you would reduce the pressure on the system. So in that sense, I, I believe the amyloid hypothesis. Yes, I do. But I think, as I showed with that diagram, it's got many, the simple view of the hypothesis has got many deficiencies. And, uh, you know, I think that we had not suspected microglia were involved when we drew those diagrams. So I do believe the hypothesis, but I also think it's much, much more complicated than that original childish cartoon suggested. Okay, great. Um, uh, this will take us, as you as you mentioned clearly in your presentation, to uh, that many um, um, clinical trials uh, targeting amyloid uh, have been failed, unfortunately failed. And uh, you 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 put the reason, which is I think uh, most of uh, us believe in that, because maybe. They, they, they uh, started the treatment at very late stage, and therefore it would be too late to make any difference uh, to reverse the damage already happened. Um, recently, which is, you know, um, uh, Biogen has announced the good news um, where they already submitted their application, so FDA for approval. What do you think of their uh, drug? Well, um, I'm, well, the first thing, to say is it's not a miracle cure. It's clearly, I mean, as you, th those of us who followed this will know they thought that the trial had failed and it was a reanalysis that gave them more hope. So this tells you that either it worked a little bit or it didn't work. Now I am, I am inclined to be optimistic that it worked a little bit, but it is absolute, I think the one thing we can be certain about is that it is not going to be a miracle cure. That we can be certain about, I think. And, uh, but I think it's very important, even if it only has a marginal effect, because it tells us we're on the right path. So, you know, we, know, we can see that it's not going to be the end. It's not going to be that in 10 years we're all taking aducanumab. That is not going to be the case. It might have us, I'm hopeful, it has a small effect. Great, that's a still hope. Yes. So we still have hope. I mean, that's I have, uh, some hope. I have some hope. I would bet. I would bet. I would bet bet a hundred pounds on aducanumab, but not a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, they, we still have a long way to go, as you know, Alzheimer's disease is, is when it comes at the late stages, 
pathology is quite complicated. It's not only amyloid plaques and fungus. They, you have a, a Lewy bodies, TDP43, and maybe others uh, even unknown. We don't know yet. Um, I mean, we need your view. I mean, ta ta targeting only one uh, like amyloid plaques will be enough. Oh, you think well, if we, we can think, combine drugs will be... Better. Well, I think we will be heading down the road. Down the road, we will be heading for combining drugs. I definitely think that. I mean, I definitely think... I mean, and that's not a surprise in a sense. I mean, uh, I'm a type 2 diabetic, like many in Qatar. And I take... I've taken my statin... Well, I take the statin in the evening. I take blood pressure medication. I take metformin. So um, polypharmacy for complicated diseases is where you always end up. So I think we are. Having said that's where we will be eventually. What I also think, though, is that we know from the mouse work uh, that amyloid pushes tau pathology. And actually, we also know from work from Maslier that uh, amyloid pushes synuclein pathology. So yeah. by attacking amyloid, you are indirectly perhaps attacking the tau and the synuclein pathology to some extent. Um, okay, I mean, uh, we have only a couple of questions left and uh, one of them, uh, do you think it might be um, a common drug for neurodegenerative diseases? No, I, 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 well, no, I, I, what I, I have to say the most, the thing I'm the most excited about though, in all of therapies is antisense therapies. This is what I am most excited about. Maybe if you have another dementia forum, you should invite people to give that talk. So not a common, not a common, uh, not a common therapy, but a common approach. I'm really excited by the idea that, for example, if you reduced APP production through antisense, you might help with Alzheimer's disease. If you reduced uh, tau production through anti-tau and synuclein production through anti-synuclein, these might be very good and, and similar approaches. Last question which came from our audience uh, asking, um, do you think that there's a link between infectious disease, since we are going through COVID pandemics, and neurodegeneration or neurodegenerative diseases? Oh, there is, and I'm trying to understand that at the moment. Of course, and I'm sure you know Amar, but maybe not everyone in the audience. The ninth, the last pandemic, the last pandemic. Of course, there's been the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome and and SARS more recently, but the last pandemic was the 1919 flu epidemic, and that led to post-encephalitic Parkinson's disease so a tangle disease so i really do think that we should be following those individuals who recover from covid infections we should be following them and seeing if they do get get other other symptoms later i think that's important to do um uh well uh approached our end of the session. It was great, you know, uh, discussions with you, um, John, and thank you so much again for your time and for the fantastic presentation. And we hope and wish in the future when, you know, COVID go away, you visit us again after 11, 12 years, uh, last time when you were here to see the progress and the advancement happen in science, education and research in Qatar. We are very excited and we, we look forward to establish such collaboration with your uh, team and others uh, from UK. Thank you so much, John. I would love to be helpful to you. It's, uh, it's, and it was nice to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Professor Hardy, and thank you, Dr. Omar. Uh, we will move next uh, into our program to the next point, academic health for which I would like to welcome Professor Michael Freno. Very rarely do we get excellence of clinician and excellence of academic researcher all in one. I have the privilege to introduce Professor Michael Freno, who exemplifies that. 
Professor Freno is a senior cardiologist consultant with extensive experience leading positions in United Kingdom, Australia, among others. Currently, he is the chief of scientific, academic, and faculty affairs, academic health systems at Hamad Medical Corporation. He will take us to the next steps of dementia research in Qatar. Welcome, Professor Michael. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for the introduction and, and indeed for the invitation to attend this important meeting. So, so I was asked to, uh, to present on a little bit of the background of Qatar's academic health system, um, to then talk a little bit about the local um, environment in terms of dementia research uh, at present and how the academic health system may help with both within Qatar and external uh, collaborations to take uh, dementia research to the next level. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to do so. Um, uh, and uh, I'm fully aware of the, the huge importance of, of dementia and research in dementia, not just because of close family members who've been affected like most of us, but also because uh, in my time in the UK, um, I was um, appointed by the Medical Research Council in the UK to sit on the advisory group for the UK Dementia Platform. So it became very clear to me um, that we're at an exciting phase in this disease. Um, and I think it would be really important if Qatar can play its part in, in the process of resolving many of these important issues. So next slide, please. So just to give a little bit of a background, uh, Qatar has a national academic health system and it's a partnership between healthcare providers and academic centers. So on the healthcare side, um, it involves Hamad Medical Corporation, which for those from overseas um, is, a, is a effect, effectively a national health service for secondary and tertiary care. Uh, and Hamad Medical Corporation hosts and funds the academic health system. Primary Healthcare Corporation, which provides primary care within Qatar, and Sidra Medicine, which provides tertiary services for uh, women's health and uh, pediatrics, are also part of this uh, system. And the academic partners include Qatar University, which has a medical school and a dental school, Vile Cornell Medicine Qatar, which has a medical school, Hamid bin Khalifa University, which includes Qatar Biomedical Research Institute, which we have representatives from today, but also uh, importantly, Qatar Computing Research Institute, which, which um, does an awful lot of work at the health uh, and biomedical interface uh, with its expertise in digital health, in, in artificial intelligence. University of Calgary, Qatar, College of the North Atlantic, Qatar, but also, although not strictly part of the academic health system at its inception, um, within our uh, within our working group, we've included representation from Qatar Precision Medicine Institute, which includes Qatar's own genome uh, program, uh, which is making huge progress, and Qatar's biobank. Next slide, please. So we, uh, uh, within the academic health system, we have um, huge potential. Uh, and that includes the fact that we have an outstanding research and educational ecosystem provided by our partners, which are, I've described. We have across Qatar, across these health institutions, a electronic patient record system, CERNA, with an intention over the next couple of years to produce um, an electronic data warehouse housed by the ministry, uh, which would have, uh, uh, which would be accessible, uh, subject to uh, approval, uh, by all uh, for anonymized data and would have uh, appropriate software actually at, at its front end. We have excellent imaging facilities across uh, Qatar. Uh, Qatar has huge ambition and a track record for delivery. And a number of the clinical services in HMC and SIDRA are of unprecedented size. Uh, as a result of this interaction between uh, the healthcare system, the academic systems, HMC uh, has been accredited by JCI as the entire system as an academic medical center, to my knowledge, the only one outside North America. 
There's been a massive investment in state-of-the-art hospitals, and we have a high-quality work, work, uh, work, workforce. And there are huge opportunities afforded by Qatar Biobank and Qatar Genome Project. So lots of potential uh, for the coming years. Next slide, please. So the aim of the academic health system is to leverage research and education for the benefit of patient care and community health. And the flip side of that coin is to provide um, uh, access to uh, a healthcare environment to facilitate high quality translational research and high quality educational programs for our academic partners. And the HS mission is delivered in part through our clinical institutes. We have clinical institutes in cancer, metabolic with uh, a focus particularly on diabetes, neurosciences with a particular focus on stroke, oral health, dermatology, cardiac, and, and we've got further institutes in the planning phase. Next, next slide, please. To give some idea of the sorts of things which, which these clinical institutes do, I, I, I've given as an example diabetes. So this clinical institute has a number of activities which are, are, are in place in order to meet the aims of the academic health system. So at a community level, uh, it, for example, has undertake, undertaken detailed national surveys of diabetes in Qatar, prevalence, risk factors, genetics, public health awareness campaigns promoting healthy lifestyles. In terms of clinical practice, uh, it's uh, introduced pr preventive uh, practices within primary care delivered through PHCC, curative and advanced curative care delivered through specialized clinics uh, within the Qatar Metabolic Institute. It conducts uh, bench research, basic and translational research, for example, on the role of the endoplasmic reticulum in the development of diabetes, the biology of white and brown adipose tissue in obese subjects with and without diabetes, genetic variability and susceptibility to type 2 diabetes in Qatar, bedside research, efficacy and effectiveness studies of new and existing treatments at HMC and in PHC, gene therapy for diabetic retinopathy, novel nanotechnology-based approaches for the treatment uh, of obesity. And it uh, organizes both undergraduate and postgraduate graduate training for health professionals. So this illustrates the, the, the sort of scope of our clinical institutes. Next slide, please. So our ambition and achievement, and this is relevant to uh, discussions here, have also helped us to support the development of key international partnerships, uh, and we have several of these now. Part of the academic health system within HMC uh, is the Medical Research Center, which is um, the governance structure for research within HMC, but also funds intramural grants. And over the last three or four years, we've allocated over 60 million rials to internal research and routine grants to underpin uh, research. And also, we've made a major investment last few months in COVID research with a fast track COVID research um, uh, pathway. And we processed in a matter of three or four months, 260 COVID research applications of which we funded a, a very large number. We've supported the development of a COVID biorepository and a COVID data warehouse. And uh, the other thing that it's allowed us to achieve, as I mentioned, is to become the health, first health organization outside of North America to be accredited as a whole system, um, uh, a whole academic uh, medical center system. So our, our challenge as an HS is now to build on this foundation to create uh, an even more ambitious approach for the long term. Uh, next one, please. So to give some brief uh, context of dementia research in Qatar, um, Qatar is establishing a national dementia registry uh, the Medical Research Center, which I mentioned, which is part of the HS, has awarded funding uh, and the IRB uh, uh, approval has been awarded. So that's about to start. Qatar is involved in the Delphic study, which is a UCL initiated study from the UK, uh, which uh, stands for the Delirium and Population Health Informatics Cohort. And there's some very important collaborative research, which I'll briefly describe going on uh, regarding the use of corneal confocal microscopy in both mild cognitive impairment and dementia. If I can have the, the next one, please. 
So using confocal uh, microscopy, it's possible to visualize the corneal nerves um, as, a, uh, as a, a, a measure of neuronal degeneration. And this collaboration has involved biocorneal medicine, CATAR, HMC, and QBRI. And you can see at the bottom here, uh, pictures of the corneal nerve structure in controls on the left, uh, a patient with mild cognitive impairment, and a patient with dementia. And what you'll see, of course, is a loss of the neuronal density, a loss of branching, um, and, and we'll come on to show that in the next slide, the differences between groups. Next one, please. So this is a paper published last year by the group, uh, which compared um, uh, the corneal nerve fiber measures uh, in healthy controls, patients with mild cognitive impairment and dementia. And if we look at the left, uh, at the left hand side figure, you can see that there is a, uh, a reduction in nerve fiber density, a marked reduction in dementia, and a, a less uh, marked, but nevertheless significant reduction in mild cognitive impairment. Looking at the middle, uh, there is a similar pattern for nerve branch density, and on the right, a similar pattern for nerve fiber length. So this appears to be a useful uh, technique for identifying the changes in neuronal structure. If we have the next one, please. So this um, uh, paper, which is in press, uh, looked at the ability of corneal fiber uh, nerve structure to predict um, mild cognitive impairment and dementia and compared it to the use of MRI looking at temporal lobe atrophy. And you can see that um, if we look at uh, mild cognitive impairment, actually, um, you'll see the line of identity in black. Um, and you can see that um, for mild cognitive impairment, temporal lobe atrophy was relatively poor. Its area under the curve was really very poor. Uh, but the three measures of uh, corneal nerve fiber uh, structure uh, actually were reasonably predictive with areas under the curve of about 0.7, so moderately predictive, so much better than MRI. For dementia, on the other hand, um, the areas under the curve were better and were relatively similar between corneal nerve fiber uh, structure and MRI. So suggesting that this may be a promising technique we look at the next one, please. So on the basis of this earlier work, um, the group have been awarded uh, a grant from NPRP uh, between these three institutions with the key investigators shown here. And if we move on to the next one, the primary aim of this uh, study is to determine the diagnostic accuracy of these measures from MCI and dementia in a much larger sample size, 400, in order to validate this earlier data and to determine the prognostic accuracy of these measures for the conversion of MCI to dementia and a number of important secondary goals to determine the natural history of these CNF measures and their association with progression and also uh, to look at um, uh, to look at um, plasma biomarkers um, as well as MRI biomarkers to compare the, the, the utility of each to determine the impact of diabetes on these biomarkers and to determine the association of CNF and endothelial cell abnormalities in relation to the imaging biomarkers um, of small vessel disease in MCI and dementia. So if we move on to the next one. So the biomarkers that QBRI are looking at include a total tau and phosphorylated tau, AB40 and 42, neurofilament light, and there's some discovery work with transcript transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. The next one, please. So an example of the uh, exciting um, collaborative work that can occur across institutions, and I know there is huge ambition to increase both the scope and the strength of dementia research within Qatar and to develop collaboration with strong international units. And we're very keen to support this in any way that we can within the academic health system. At a simple level, obviously, we can provide research funding through the Medical Research Centre through our grant system. But I'm certainly very happy to enter into discussions about establishing over the next year or so collaborative cross-institutional national funding to support dementia research. So we recently 
establish between our institutions a call for national, um, uh, a national call for COVID research, which necessarily had to be of international quality and had to involve collaboration between institutions within Qatar and or internationally. I'm very happy to look at such a model for dementia research. But in the longer term, I'm very happy to look at including infrastructure support for national and international dementia research in next year's business case. And in the medium term, to look at a case which either looks at, for example, uh, developing aging with dementia as a strong component of that, as a cross-cutting research theme between our institutes, for example, our stroke and our cardiovascular institutes, there's a very strong aging component to that. Or alternatively, to look at aging as a clinical institute going forward. Uh, this would require a business case because that's how, how we're funded. We're not given a tranche of money. We're given funding which is linked to business cases for particular projects. But I see this as very important and I'm very happy to support that and to enter into discussions. So in summary, we're very, very keen to help and we see this as being an important issue. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Frenox, for this interesting presentation. It is really very interesting to know how the academic health system works in Qatar and how it's also integrated. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Uh, now, now we will move to our next uh, speaker. But before, I would like to thank uh, all the ladies and gentlemen for the ongoing attention. Uh, I will take all of you to our second keynote speaker, which is Professor Henry Brodati. Welcome, Professor Brodati. Uh, Professor Henry Brodati will talk about risk reduction in dementia. His talk title is Maintain Your Brain, Can We Prevent Dementia? Uh, Professor Brodati is a senior psychogeriatrician at Prince of Wales Hospital, Sydney, and deputy editor of International Psychogeriatrics. He serves on multiple committees for the NSW and Australian governments and the WHO. Professor Brodati received the prize for the world's best development, advance or achievement that enhances quality of life for older people. As scientific professor of aging and mental health, co-director of the Center of Healthy Brain Aging, and director of the Mensha Center for Research Collaboration, Professor Brodati is not only a researcher and clinician, but as well a policy advisor and strong advocate for people with dementia and their carers. Please, Professor Brodati, the floor is yours. Welcome again. All right, thank you very much. Okay. So we're running late, so I, I won't read more introductions, but uh, thank you very much for the for the, uh, the opportunity to talk to you uh, about a very important topic, which is reducing the risk and early intervention. We heard um, from our first speaker, Dr. Hanadi, that this is a real priority for Qatar, and so I congratulate you on that. So we know that Alzheimer's is just one type of dementia, and I'm going to be talking about all the, all the dementias generally. Occasionally, I will differentiate between Alzheimer's and vascular or other dementias. But dementia, as we know, is an umbrella term, which includes over 100 causes, mainly Alzheimer's, vascular, Lewy body, frontotemporal, and many, many more. So dementia affects a lot of different people. Here we see uh, Margaret Thatcher, Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, Harold Wilson, Famous movie stars, Rita Hayworth, Charlton Heston. In Australia, where I am from, our Aboriginal, pe Aboriginal people have a higher rate of dementia. Dementia affects all races, all countries. There are some variations. But we know that about two thirds of the world's population with dementia are or will be in the developing world, in developing countries where the median age is much lower and the potential for prevention may be at the earliest age. I'll come to that. 
So can we prevent dementia? At post-mortem, a normal brain of an older person will weigh about 1.3 kilos. A person with dementia, it'll be shrunken. It'll be half that size. So what can we do to prevent dementia? Reducing cholesterol, maybe. Reducing physical inactivity, reducing hypertension, preventing diabetes. We heard from John Hardy about his type two diabetes, but he's taking metformin. We just published a paper from one of our cohort studies that just came out last week, showing that people who have type two diabetes and take metformin, this was a 12 year follow up study of a cohort of a thousand people, um, had less dementia and less cognitive decline longitudinally. Smoking and obesity, I'll come to these in more detail. The general message about our prevention is it's never too late to do something about this and never too early. So can we prevent dementia? Probably not. We can't do what we've done with smallpox, eradicate it from the planet. The best prospect may be a vaccine, but so far trials have failed. But maybe we can delay it. Because it's largely a disease of late life, if we can delay the manifestation of Alzheimer's or dementia in general, by just two years, the prevalence would be dropped by, say, 20%. Five years, 50%. Maybe the most important target is in early life. And I was talking about developing countries. Where there are low, where, sorry, where there are high rates of low fetal birth weight or gestational age, where there is poor education, poor socioeconomic environment, high rates of fetal maldevelopment, growing up with parents who've had poor education and occupation, and often a poor dietary history. And some of these factors may be the reasons that in Australia, the Aboriginal population has a higher rate of dementia, particularly Alzheimer's. This is a study that came out this year from the Rush uh, Memory and Aging Study in Chicago. It was based on post-mortems, average age of 90. And they looked back at early life cognitive enrichment. The children who had a much richer cognitive life up to the age of 12, a lot more stimulation, uh, learning different languages or, or, or instruments. 80 years later, had less Alzheimer's pathology, not other dementia pathology. They had less cognitive decline and better late life cognitive health, mainly through the association with less AD pathology. So here's where the epidemiologists and pathologists could be in the same room at the conference. Now, what about cardiovascular factors? The more vascular risk factors we have, the greater the risk for Alzheimer's specifically and dementia generally. So if we add all these up, the odds ratio just goes up as we can see in this histogram. Midlife hypertension has been associated with late life dementia. Treating blood pressure decreases the risk in some but not all studies. Each year of treatment decreases the risk. And there was a meta-analysis that came out just this year in JAMA, looking at 14 randomized controlled trials, confirming the benefits of using antihypertensives. There's a caveat. In very old people, too vigorous treatment of blood pressure can be harmful. So um, one of the key documents came out at the end of July, 
the Lancet Commission from Jill Livingston, has looked at prevention in a lot of detail, and I recommend it to the audience if you want to get a really good up snapshot of what's happening in the field. It builds on the 2017 Lancet Commission, which she led as well, a great team of authors. And what this showed, what they quoted, was four meta-analyses, all showing the same effect, treating blood pressure, reduce the risk. It was about 20% lower for dementia and 20% lower for Alzheimer's specifically. And about 50% lower, 50% lower for vascular dementia. Now, some people have said that calcium channel blockers might have a specific role, but in this, these meta-analysis, there was no difference by the type of antihypertensive. In this trial, they evaluated whether treating systolic blood pressure more vigorously using 120 millimeters as the threshold got better results than using 140 millimeters, the standard treatment for hypertension. And the answer was yes. The people with a more rigorous treatment had less mild cognitive impairment and had a trend for less dementia. And on MRI, there was less increase in the number of white matter lesions. So people are now reducing the cut point for treatment of hypertension. Statins? Well, people say it decreased in risk. Some people said the statins increased memory loss. But probably the bottom line is there's neither prevention nor risk with statins on group data. I've certainly met individuals who've had marked memory problems with certain statins. And there may be variations by strain, by the, by the type of statin, by sex and by race. I'm quite passionate about physical activity. I mean, I, I exercise every morning, I, I, I'm addicted to it. Um, and the message here in, in spades is never too late and never too early. And the evidence I think is pretty strong. The physical activity is protective against cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's, vascular dementia in particular. How much? Well, the general rule is at least three times a week, probably five times a week, at least half an hour a day, or 150 minutes a week. The more we do, the better. Going for a walk, talking gentle and, and uh, not getting puffed is probably not doing very much. We need to get puffed, we need to get sweaty. It may be that aerobic and or anaerobic together is better than, uh, or mixed, is better than just doing one or the other. And for older people, it's important that they start slowly and build up slowly and check with their doctor if there's any contraindication. You know, if we could put physical exercise in a pill, it'd be just wonderful. It's not something we can outsource. We have to do it ourselves. It preserves cognition, it slows cognitive decline, it decreases incident dementia. And in animal models, we see quite striking results of brain volume being better, uh, more brain derived neurotrophic factor, less inflammation, and genetically engineered mice uh, who are identical. Some put mice put in a cage where they can exercise, others in a sterile cage. There are differences in the Alzheimer's disease pathology. I, I really enjoy this study. Uh, this was for, I think, 70-year-old people with mild cognitive impairment uh, who didn't exercise, and they were randomized to do exercise or not. And they had MRIs of their temporal lobes done, the hippocampus done, before and 12 months later. The exercise group, the hippocampus, actually got bigger slightly. And in the non-exercise group, this is left and right, the two figures, the hippocampus uh, shrunk by about 0.7%, which is what happens each year. Um, there have been... Uh, some recent studies, which are, I think, much more convincing. This is the uh, Hunt study, 
almost 30,000 people aged 30 to 60. I just said, do you do exercise at least once a week, moderate to physically, moderate to vigorously? And those who did had 20% less dementia over the next 25 years than those who didn't. The Whitehall study over 10,000 people also showed benefit of exercise over 10 years. And in um, some meta-analyses that Livingston uh, combined, uh, healthy adults over 50 in 39 randomized control trials who did exercise between 45 and 60 minutes at least once a week had better global cognition, especially with aerobic exercise. Now, the WHO recommendations are not so strong. By the way, they're now a little bit old, um, and there are some more studies that have come out since they were uh, published. Um, and they concluded that physical exercise has a small positive effect on normal cognition and a possible effect on MCI. But of course, there are many benefits from physical activity. Fitness, heart disease, blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, morbidity, mortality. I'm a psychogeriatrician, improves mental health, improves confidence, and improves quality of life. What about brain exercises? It's a bit more controversial. Um, so, um, again, quoting uh, the Livingston uh, Review, three systematic reviews found there was no benefit in healthy older people generally, although they got better in what they got trained to do. So this is the great controversy. Do you just get better at doing those exercises or does it work better in real life? For mild cognitive impairment, the evidence is more convincing, um, with a moderate effect on general cognition, on function, active daily living, on a metacognition, sort of knowing about your cognition. Uh, but two systematic reviews had uh, less convincing evidence. Uh, there's been one randomized control trial which showed less memory decline over two years. So what sort of brain exercises? I give a lot of public talks and people say, does doing crosswords save my brain or doing Sudoku? Probably not enough. Cognitive, computerized cognitive training, there's a heap of different companies making a lot of money on this. And I think there's still evidence that it does help people who are healthy. And I see it in the patients who come and see me. Uh, and particularly with MCI. With dementia, I think the evidence is much softer. It may, maybe it's already getting a bit late in the time. And as I mentioned, the controversy is about whether the benefits generalize and whether they're sustained. My colleagues have been doing a lot of research on this in our Center for Healthy Brain Aging. And they found that doing it two or three times a week, particularly in a group situation, is probably best. And maybe after about six weeks, it starts to plateau and you just need boosters after that. Obesity. There's a curious paradox. Midlife obesity has been associated with increased risk of dementia in later life. A BMI of 25 to 30 had about a 34% increased risk. A basal metabolic index of over 30, in other words, obesity, had a 90% increased risk. But here's the paradox. Once you're over about 75, being overweight ceases to be a risk factor. In fact, it may be protective. Or it may be because people who do develop dementia start losing weight. And so we get this paradoxical finding. Or it may be a survivor effect. The people who got there uh, are more resilient in other ways. Can you eat your way to brain health? Livingston didn't include diet in her review because she said the evidence was too difficult. 
There is quite a lot of evidence about the Mediterranean diet. That's a diet abundant in plant foods, lots of fresh fruit, fruit, olive oil, moderate amounts of dairy products, fish and poultry, low amounts of red meat, perhaps some wine. Total fat should be less than a third of the diet and saturated fats less than 8%. And people construct these pyramids where you see the grains at the bottom, the fruit and vegetables in the next uh, part of the, the next tier of the pyramid, moderate amounts of fish and moderate, lesser amounts of eggs and dairy and smaller amounts of red meat. Now, it doesn't have to be the Mediterranean diet from Italy or Greece. You can do the same principles in an Eastern diet or a Middle Eastern diet. David Smith from Oxford uh, led the Optima group and uh, published a series of papers showing that high doses of folic acid, vitamin B12 and vitamin B6 reduce brain atrophy, improve cognition, and particularly in people who had high homocysteine levels. As always happens in our field, some people come along and do systematic reviews and showed no benefit from these. So I think the evidence is out. And we used to run a memory clinic for about 30 years uh, in Sydney. Um, uh, and uh, we used to do regular fasting homocysteine levels and put people on these sort of regimen uh, if they had high homocysteine. But uh, we've stopped doing it. Uh, I'm still not sure about what to do about it. I think the evidence is uh, not very strong. Vitamin D. Low levels of vitamin D are very common in older people. Low levels of vitamin D are associated with poorer cognition and more dementia. But there's never been any evidence that taking vitamin D makes any difference. So this is one another paradox that we have in our field. Anti-inflammatories, the general, general recommendation is not to take these. The evidence uh, is mixed at best and it can cause side effects. Fish oil, there's some evidence. Uh, fish is better than taking the supplements. And in general, eating the food is better than taking the tablets or supplements. So the WHO uh, said that these are not recommended to reduce the risk of cognitive decline and made this a very strong recommendation. Smoking, we know smoking is bad for our lungs, our heart. What a lot of people don't realize it's bad for our brains as well. Not just because of the vascular effects, but directly through the Alzheimer's effects as well. The good news is, people stop smoking, the risk drops pretty significantly. Alcohol, um, I'm not sure how much alcohol people drink in Qatar, but uh, in Australia, they drink a lot of alcohol. And uh, they love hearing that eat, eat, drinking moderate amount of alcohol might be good for your brain. I think the evidence is pretty, um, is not very firm about this. And uh, certainly people who are abstinent seem to have a higher risk and people who are heavy drinkers definitely have a higher risk. But whether abstinence is, uh, is a risk factor or is caused by health problems which then associate with dementia is one of the, uh, the anomalies. Which sort of alcohol? Again, I think the studies don't really show it. Theoretically, it may be better with wine, particularly red wine, stronger in antioxidants and polyphenols. But alcohol has been linked to cancer as well, so <laughs> we can't win here on this one. Many natural therapies proposed for Alzheimer's disease and dementia in general. Most have no evidence. Some have evidence of no effect. So two large studies of Ginkgo biloba, the, uh, the GEM study in the United States, and um, the, the one from France uh, showed no benefit over placebo. Uh, the study of vitamin E and selenium in men to try and stop uh, prostate cancer. Um, and as a side, they looked at the effect on cognition and showed no benefit at all. The other ones, uh, we just don't have evidence. 
the newest one on the block is hearing loss. And in the 2017 Lancet Commission, these results were presented. Relative risks are between 55% higher to 167% higher in follow-ups between nine and 17 years of an association between peripheral hearing loss and risk for dementia. For every 10 decibels of worse hearing, there was a 30% increased risk of dementia. There's also a study last year which showed that midlife hearing loss was associated with steeper temporal lobe volume loss on follow-up. And I'll, I'll come back to the contribution, relative contribution of hearing loss. The good news is we're now starting to see evidence that using hearing aids may actually make a difference. Now, these are studies from 2018. There are lots of studies underway currently. The WHO report said insufficient evidence. But I think the evidence is accumulating. And people who use hearing aids in middle life are more likely to continue using it. People who get a hearing aid in their 80s, like my mother, the hearing aid sits in a drawer. <laughs> they never use it. So it's a, it's a real problem getting, getting very old people to use hearing aids. They're small, they're fiddly, it's hard to see where to put the batteries in. Uh, it's technically quite difficult. We've had a particular interest in social isolation. And we're heavily invested in this research at the moment. And the actual risk associated by social isolation is significant. It's as high, it's as, high as physical inactivity. Um, a student of mine did a study, a uh, better analysis, where he looked at social uh, contact, social participation, and loneliness. These were associated with a 57% increased risk of dementia. Flipping the coin, people who are more socially engaged had a 22% reduction in risk. WHO says insufficient evidence, but it's good for you in other ways. Um, so we're now looking at this, and uh, it's very hard to do controlled trials to get people to socialize and not socialize. So it's mainly observational studies. HRT. Well, the Women's Health Initiative said it was bad for our brains. Our people have done reanalyses. And I think the evidence now is it's neither harmful or beneficial, close to the menopause. The Women's Health Initiative study, women started taking HRT from the age of 65. Sleep. This is an emerging area of research. About half of older adults have regular insomnia. About one in two have sleep disordered breathing. We know that slow wave sleep is associated with amyloid beta protein clearance from the brain. And if people have poor sleep disorder, have sleep disordered breathing, they're going to have worse sleep. Worse sleep, worse cognition. Now, the question can correcting insomnia and sleep disordered breathing prevent or delay? Well, we don't know yet. And there's always this issue of reverse causality. Do people have had the 20 year buildup of the Alzheimer protein? Is that what's causing the sleep disorders or is it vice versa? And the epidemiological studies are, are, are confounded by the fact that people, when they do develop dementia, sometimes have increased sleep as well. Air pollution. 13 longitudinal studies, uh, this is a colleague of ours at UNSW, University of South Wales, um, did a systematic review of 13 studies with up to 15 years follow-up, exposure to particulate matter, nitrous oxide or carbon monoxide were all associated with increased risk of dementia. And this photograph is from a National Geographic, um, which uh, had the headline, air pollution robs us of our smarts, and our lungs. This is a huge study from Denmark, I think it was, yeah. Uh, 
like hundreds of thousands of people with the, with the wonderful registry data that they have there, registry data that they have there, showing that traumatic brain injury was a risk for all causes of dementia. They didn't look at particular types. And it was for all severities of TBI. We've just done a, a study of our cohort. We found no linkage, but I think our measure of TBI might not have been as good as it should be. So putting all this together, and this is the latest figure uh, from Livingston. And we see at the top of the figure, this is early life. And the major factor here is education. Education, education, education. And it contributing 7% um, of the population attributable risk. All of these factors together, even when you allow for the, the fact that they interact like diabetes, physical inactivity and, and uh, obesity, account for 40% of the population attributable risk. In other words, to get rid of all these risk factors, um, we would reduce the prevalence by 40%. In midlife, hearing loss, 8%, traumatic brain injury, hypertension, alcohol, heavy drinking of alcohol, and obesity. And in late life, smoking, depression, social isolation, physical inactivity, air pollution, and uh, diabetes. But these are things we can do something about now. John Hardy mentioned that the incidence of dementia appears to be declining in the Western world. In some countries, Japan, South Korea, and Hong Kong, that effect is not happening. Some studies show this was effect was sex specific others haven't why is this happening probably because we're living better we're getting better education we're getting built better health care we're looking after our blood pressure our hearts we're not dying of heart disease um, and maybe these factors are responsible for the decreased risk of dementia in later life i mean the rate's still going up because we're living longer but the incidence may be dropping in some countries. And maybe the countries where it's not dropping is because of the other epidemics that are happening in the world now, obesity and diabetes. And in many of these developing countries, the rates of smoking is still very high. I mean, I, I shocked when I go to Europe, uh, continental Europe, how many people still smoke there. Um, Whereas in Australia and the US and uh, perhaps in the UK as well, the rates have dropped considerably. So putting all this together, we need intervention studies to prove these effects. These are all observational epidemiological studies. And the first one to show it a benefit was the finger study from Finland. And they had a package of intervention, diet, cognitive training, exercise, managing met metabolic and vascular risk factors and social activity. And the effects are two years, a modest improvement on composite neuropsychological battery, speed of information processing, executive function, and not memory, but yes, for complex memory. I, I won't go into that. And at five years, other benefits are now being published. We're doing a study, a, a prevention study, it's called Maintain Your Brain. And what's novel about this is it's all online. We've randomized over 6,000 people, aged 55 to 77. We're just finishing year two of follow-up. We don't have any results yet. Um, and depending, the people have to be eligible to have at least two risk factors. And 90% of the population are, do have these. And there are four basic modules. They did one module a quarter in the first year, and then monthly boosters thereafter. Physical activity, diet, nutrition, brain training, and depression or anxiety treatment. There are also drug studies. Unfortunately, all have failed, as we've heard. Like what we've heard about earlier, we're all hoping aducanumab might work. Um, but the positive results only in one of the two trials and then only in the high dose 
and uh, as uh, John Hardy said, uh, only after reanalysis. It's been submitted to the FDA. The papers have not been published. We haven't seen the details. Um, I've spoken to Biogen about this. It's going to be a monthly intravenous infusion. It's going to be expensive. It's not going to be widely available. And I was really pleased to hear that this isn't going to be seen as the, uh, the cure-all, because it certainly isn't. And in most countries in the world, it's not going to be viable at all. So what are the policy implications from this? Can we prevent Alzheimer's other dementias? Other dementias? No, not yet. But it's possible to delay it. I've shown you these figures. Small delays can have major effects on the prevalence. Ideally, we'd like to delay it till after we die. Our challenge, our challenge is to influence government and bureaucracy. Sounds like Qatar is right on board. I wish we could have the same commitment in Australia. You know, we need a whole of life approach. Educate the population about using, keeping their brain active, exercise, engagement, retiring later. It's good for the economy, it's good for the brain. We need to work with our colleagues in primary care and in the specialties in cardiac, diabetes, hypertension, because they're seeing the diseases which will lead to cognitive decline later. And developing programs that are scalable. We have high hopes for our internet-based program. If that shows benefit over the information only group, uh, then we have something that's scalable at a national, international level. But clinicians listening to me today, all of us need to be the change. We need to advise this to our patient. We need to do it ourselves and lead by example. I've focused on primary prevention. Now I'll just take two minutes to talk about secondary and tertiary prevention. So primary prevention is preventing something, in, in preventing a disease in somebody who doesn't have any symptoms, or any, any, uh, any obvious uh, manifestations of it. So taking a statin because we know we have a high cholesterol to prevent heart disease. Secondary prevention is treating something early. So perhaps people with MCI, we should be doing all these things and we certainly advise this in our clinic. All the same things I've been talking about. What's not appreciated, and I think what's done badly around the world, is tertiary prevention. Once a person has diagnosis of dementia, not to condemn them to say, get your affairs in order, that's the end of your life. But do what we do for stroke, rehabilitation, maintaining quality of life, being positive, holistic, providing support for the person living with dementia and for their care partner. We know people with dementia can live positively for many years. We know we can help people compensate for their disabilities and build on their assets. A reablement model is what's taking hold now. All the things I've talked about earlier, such as keeping active physically, cognitive and socially and eating well, should be recommended for people with dementia. Tailoring activities to the person, um, a peer support program. We see this with breast cancer, where a woman with breast cancer or re, re, telephone a woman recently diagnosed, become a buddy, someone that she can talk to, and we can have the same sort of thing happening. Dementia Alliance International is an online virtual group for people with dementia, by people with dementia. And supporting the care partner is critical. And I mentioned Alzheimer's Disease International and Alzheimer's associations all over the world. And I found on the ADI, ADI website, the Qatar Alzheimer's Society as well. And I'm, I don't know, Dr. Hamadi, that's your, uh, your email address, but that's what's listed there. So I write a on my prescription pad a referral to the, to the Alzheimer's Association. So let me finish up. There's accumulating evidence that we can prevent or at least delay the onset of age-related cognitive decline. Livingston has shown that 12 risk factors account for 40% of the population attributable risk. We can also work to secondary prevention for MCI 
and tertiary prevention to enhance people's ability to live positively with dementia for many years. Um, this talk will be available on our website um, and I, we have a couple of websites and uh, my email is there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Brodati, for this fascinating talk. Uh, you have highlighted very well all the prevention and risk factors for dementia. Uh, I am 100% sure within the audience and between ourselves, there are lots, there is a lot of reflection going on, right? We really need to change our habits for a better health. And always as professionals, health professionals, uh, work with, with prevention because that will be cheaper for the health economy, okay? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to, to invite uh, Dr. Biju Bashkaran, who is our consultant geriatrician and risk reduction lead for dementia in Qatar. Uh, please, Dr. Bashkaran, can we continue with the 10 minutes question and answer session, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Brodachi, for such an interesting and uh, informative talk. Um, it was really you know, exciting to know about uh, some of the recent evidences um, and recommendations uh, that has come out. Um, and I think as it became very clear through the presentation that, you know, um, it's very, really stressed, like we need to act as early as possible, and it is never too late uh, to start our actions. And that is really, you know, in context uh, with earlier what Professor Hardy mentioned as well, the pathogenesis actually you know, clearly uh, shows us that this is a process that starts very early in the brain um, and the need for early control of the risk factors and so on. So I think uh, you know, um, putting, uh, going through the day, it's very clear for us um, who are all involved, who all sort of uh, listen to the talks, um, that it's uh, you know, um, something that we need to think and act you know, early in our life um, as early as possible. Now, coming to the questions, uh, given the time limits, I think um, you know uh, we have some interesting questions from the audience. Um, one of them is about delirium. So there is evidence that clearly shows that delirium increases the future risk of dementia significantly. And when we look at the guidelines, however, from the um, World Health Organization and the Lancet Commission recommendations, um, they does not sort of uh, reflect the importance of delirium um, and it doesn't come in the recommendations um, in terms of you know, any preventative role uh, for decreasing the incidence or you know, um, sort of uh, delaying the de development of dementia, especially in the later life. Um, what is your view, uh, Professor Brodacci, regarding this? And do you feel that the future dementia risk reduction strategies uh, would include delirium? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, delirium is a risk factor for dementia. Dementia is a risk factor for delirium. Um, and uh, we know that uh, people, you know, in our hospital, something like half of the people coming in admitted through the emergency department are over 70, and a third of them will have cognitive impairment. Uh, delirium or dementia or both. And whether delirium is a cause for the dementia or delirium is unmasking a cognitive decline that hasn't been recognized earlier uh, is unclear. Can we prevent delirium? Well, regardless of dementia, everyone tries to prevent delirium by good hydration and making sure electrolytes and everything are fine uh, before going to operation. Um, and I'm not sure that we've been very successful in, in preventing delirium. I don't know of any evidence to show that if we did prevent delirium, you really can't do a controlled trial on this because everyone will want to prevent delirium. You can't let people go and not prevent delirium. So it would, it would be impossible to have a good control group. Uh, and I think that's why there's not really included in any of the, um, the guidelines about it. But there's certainly an association between delirium and future dementia. I mean, when I was a student, we were taught delirium is a self-limiting disease. People get better and return back to normal. But in the last decade or two, we know that people with delirium do have residual 
uh, cognitive deficits, particularly the older they are, the more likely they are to have underlying uh, brain pathology, which makes them vulnerable to delirium in the first place. So um, it's a complicated issue. Uh, thank you for raising it. Thank you very much, Professor Bernacki. So, so I think, um, yes, um, yeah, I think uh, there is a difficulty there with regards to, you know, um, which one is, is the first thing to happen. And, yes. you know, and it's really difficult to, to delineate that um, and to, uh, to say certainly, you know, it would help. Thank you. Now, the, 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 we have another question, which is about, you know, again, about the uh, risk factors for um, cardiovascular risk factors to dementia. Um, we, we saw that, you know, you have uh, very uh, sort of uh, clearly showed us um, the evidence on that, the midlife uh, sort of risk factors like hypertension and diabetes and their role uh, in the development of dementia in the later life. Now, we have had a study, uh, as Dr. Hanadi uh, sort of touched on in the beginning of the uh, talk, um, where we did in Qatar look at, you know, the uh, incidence of dementia in the above 65 year age group. And we came across that there is a lot of uh, proportion of uh, people with MCI um, and with risk factors too. So in terms of, um, you know, the role of uh, controlling the risk factors in the later age group, uh, how much evidence do we have, um, you know, in terms of controlling blood pressure or diabetes or um, yeah. the cardiovascular risk factors in the, in the later? Uh, can that help as well? Yeah. So uh, I mentioned the study that we, we just published looking at metformin, and that was in a group of 70 to 90 year olds at recruitment um, 14 years ago. And uh, we just analyzed the data. I think it was about, it was a thousand plus people in the study and about 230, I think had, uh, or maybe it wasn't that high, it, um, had diabetes. Proportion were on metformin, type two diabetes. Proportion were not on metformin and the rates of cognitive decline and the rates of dementia over 12 years were less in the people on metformin. But all the other things I've mentioned about uh, cholesterol, uh, sorry, about uh, exercise, uh, it certainly can reduce the, um, the impact of type two diabetes or even take it away. Um, treating hypertension, I, you know, I showed you the uh, meta-analyses there as well. So all the, the um, the interventions we do for general health in somebody with diabetes are even more important than in the general population. I, I don't think we've had good randomized controlled trials over a longitudinal time just focusing on a diabetes po diabetic population. And that's really would be very helpful to do that. Okay, I think um, we have a, a lot of these risk factors in Qatar here. So perhaps, you know, um, this would be an ideal opportunity to, you know, look at um, you know, to, to uh, develop some studies um, in, in that sort of um, uh, population with risk factors. Right. Thank yeah, you. I'd be very, very happy about that and uh, very happy to collaborate with you on that. Yeah. Thank you. Now, we, we are like uh, in Qatar, we are trying to, you know, sort of implement um, the uh, risk reduction guidelines across the country. Um, and, you know, we are really looking at, you know, what would be the most successful factors in terms of implementing these uh, risk reduction guidelines. Uh, from your experience of dealing with risk reduction across the globe, uh, would you be able to sort of um, uh, touch on or you know, um, tell us about you know, um, any successful models of risk reduction implementation across um, that you have come across? Well, Thank you. And I, I tell you about our internet-based study. You know, we recruited 6,000 people, but it's very hard to change people's behavior. And uh, people, of the 6,000 people, at the two year follow up, I think we have about 50% of the population still with us. And if you look at their participation in exercise and uh, in weight reduction or, you know, or eating well um, or brain training, we can see a slope going down. Like in the first three months, 80% were doing everything. The second three months, when they go into the second module, it's going down to 60%. It's very hard to motivate people to change their behaviors um, until something drastic happens, but <laughs> then it's too late. 
uh, like my best friend who smoked for all his life uh, until he got uh, a, a minor stroke and then he's given up smoking at last, uh, despite everyone telling him. You know, people need something to motivate them to do that. I think education, um, having good role models, having public figures who come out and say, I'm doing this, uh, having it as part of the, uh, the, the media as well, or in the films, we, we see this, and uh, just advertising campaigns. And we, we've seen that with smoking. It's made a huge difference uh, in many countries. So it can be done. We've seen it with HIV protection. Um, Australia is one of the best, first countries to, uh, to really put the lid on HIV transmission. Um, and having very strong advertising campaigns did that. Yeah, the government really needs to be behind it. It has to be a whole of population approach. And I think it has to start in childhood. There have been some studies looking at um, doing education with children about dementia, how to interact with their grandparents, but also teaching them some of these behaviours from early age. But it, there's no simple fix for this. It really needs a concerted effort. And I really applaud what you're doing in Qatar. Uh, that was that was fantastic. Thank you, Professor Bhatti. I think um, yes. I think um, you know as you uh, mentioned. I think um, you, know, you, you, you sort of highlighted the importance of uh, having a constant um, sort of effort in sort of uh, you know highlighting the risk factors yes. to uh, all the uh, uh, public domains, all the age groups. Yes. Um, all the domains um, of uh, public population, like the working group, you know, um, people who are doing different things, as in their life as well. So, I think it's really important to have the continuous effort. Um, uh, I think is the message that, that came. came to. Thank you. Now, I think um, uh, we sort of uh, given the time constraints. Now, we probably have right. a question. Um, any sort of um, sort of uh, evidence to suggest about you know the looking at the cost benefit um, sort of uh, in relation to risk reduction measures and how much um, it would lead to uh, the reduction in terms of um, cost. Is there any evidence to suggest that? Or? Well, we know that dementia is a very expensive disease. You know, it's the, um, I think it's eight figures now suggesting it's costing around the world one trillion dollars a year. Um, it's, it's huge. Um, and just reducing the numbers of people with dementia by 20%. Would, it would, I, I haven't seen the dollars return on investment calculations, but it's, it's quite logical. It would be a huge return on investment for doing these things. Absolutely. That's absolutely. US dollars, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. That was uh, you know, um, a very interesting talk. Thank you very much, Professor Bodati. Thank you. I would okay, thank you. Pass to Dr. George now for the closing remarks for the day. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brodati and Dr. Bashkaran. Thank you for clarifying all the all the questions. Uh, dear audience and dear panelists, successfully we have reached to the end of this milestone event in Qatar's dementia journey. On behalf of Hamad Medical Corporation. I would like to thank each of the speakers and panelists for their outstanding presentations and thank the audience for the participation. We hope you have enjoyed and learned from this experience. And we are confident that this will be a starting point for future collaborative work in dementia research. We also would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Hanadi Al Hamad and Qatar National Dementia Task Force Team, and Dr. Omar and HBKU for this great collaborative event. Wishing you all peace and health. Thank you very much for today. Salam alaikum. <laughs>